Welcome back to the Bible and its cultural influence. I'm Seth Pace, and today's topic is early Christian symbols. When we think of Christian symbols, most people tend to focus on two, the cross and the ichthus, or the fish. But in reality, there is a huge plethora of symbols, and a lot of them come from early church fathers, the stories around those church fathers, and specifically the heraldry that developed during the Middle Ages. The most famous Christian symbol uh, right after the cross, or probably equal to the cross, is the ichthus. Now, the ichthus or the fish comes from the Greek word meaning the study of fish, ichthology. So, and the letters form an anagram meaning Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. When Christians started using this symbol is kind of lost. We do know that uh, Clement of Alexandria had one of the earliest references in the first century when he told Christians that they should use either the symbol of a dove or a fish as some sort of seal during their communications. Later, in the third century, we had Tertullian talking about the fact that we're all little fish and in his discussion uh, his metaphor he actually said that Christ should be used or viewed as a dolphin now he wasn't necessarily saying that that's the symbol we should use he was tying it more toward um, images of baptism and we do know there are a few other early symbols that date back as far as the ictus we know that we have the ship. There are several engravings we have on early churches and found in caves where Christians met where a ship was carved into the side of the wall, uh, as well as the fish, which fits the motif. And of course, most people know of the ichthus because of the stories tied to early Christian persecution. And when two Christians would meet and talk in order to find out or discover if the other person truly was a Christian and keep from the prying eyes of say the Roman guards or the Roman centurions around you would draw part of the fish body the top line as if you're just drawing in the dirt and then of course the other person if they wanted to acknowledge that they were a Christian they would draw the bottom half and then the shape of the fish would be in the dirt it would easily be wiped out with a swipe of a foot or a stick and you wouldn't be facing any sort of persecution from the Romans around. And you need to remember that from the time of Nero, which is roughly, you know, 54 to 68 AD, he persecuted Christians. The Romans overlooked the Christians as long as they were associated with the Jews. Because remember, in the Roman mindset, Christians, for the most part, were viewed as repulsive. And the main reason for that wasn't necessarily the fact that they were monotheistic. It was tied to the fact that their main symbol was the Last Supper. So they were viewing the blood of Christ and the body of Christ and the bread and the wine. And the Romans despised cannibalism. And that's what they thought the Christians were doing. And of course, they were persecuted pretty severely up until we finally get to the point where Constantine takes over, which we've talked about in about 307 to about uh, 337 AD is when he was around and his mother, St. Helena. And they made Christianity the official religion of Rome. Persecution stopped. Christianity was able to spread very quickly. But that wasn't constant. Um, we didn't really talk about that in the last couple of lectures, but you did have Julian come along, Julian the Emperor, and that was around 360, and he would actually reinstate pagan religions and outlaw Christianity again. So Christianity goes through a period of about 600 years where it goes back and forth 
uh, where it's being persecuted and then acknowledged and accepted and then persecuted and then back and forth. So these symbols were very powerful ways of making sure that you could communicate with others without getting taken in and tortured or killed by the Roman Empire. Now after the ichthus, one of the early symbols is the anchor. This one isn't used as much anymore, but we know in around 100 BC, the Jews were using this symbol on their coinage. And that's probably because if you look back in after Alexander the Great, uh, we had a guy come along. So Jucus the first, who was originally a general under Alexander the Great and then set up uh, as basically a governor. Um, well, no, he's actually more of a king. And he had a birthmark that represented or looked a lot like an anchor. And the Jews in the area, in order to placate him, started using that symbol on, like I said, their coinage. Later, uh, as far as it, when did it move over into a Christian symbol? We know that around 100 AD, St. Clement, who was the fourth after Peter was tied to an iron anchor and then drowned by Emperor Emperor uh, Traden. And that's because he converted a whole island and the emperor told him to stop converting people and he did it anyway. And so they tied him. And so some people think that that's why the anchor became an early, early symbol for Christians. That may have something to do with it, but a lot of scholars are drawn to the idea that it's actually a play on words because uh, enkra in Greek resembles very closely the phrase enkuro, which means in the Lord. And so most scholars now think that's why the anchor was actually used. Plus the top of the anchor, the cross beam part of the anchor looks very much like the towel cross. And so some think it was could be that it could be a hidden cross symbol but that's probably not going to be the case especially in the first century because crosses were still associated with horrible torture but the wordplay does make a lot more sense and the anchor symbol died out almost completely after about 300 AD and some have wondered, oh, well, that's because Constantine comes into power and relieves the pressure on Christians because they're no longer persecuted. So there's no reason to have these secret symbols. That may have something to do with it, but that's probably not the real reason. The reason probably is because around 300, we're switching. We're switching from Greek to Latin. So the whenever you switch over into latin then the word ankara doesn't mean the same thing anymore it doesn't have that that word play that it did in the greek and so anyway the the symbol for anchored died out until the 1600s for some strange reason and no one is quite certain the anchor reappeared in the 1600s and for about 200 years was a very popular symbol to be inscribed in tombs for Christians. Now the last main symbol in early Christianity is one that most people have never even heard of. And I find this one particularly fascinating. And this is the Christian wheel. Now, this symbol was almost completely unknown in America until about 10 years ago. But we know that there are carvings in Ephesus in the first century. And this was a very common symbol for early Christians, uh, probably on equal to maybe even a little bit more well known than the ictus fish. And you'll see two different variations of it. You'll see the eight wheel spoke, and then you'll see the six wheel spoke. And it doesn't really matter. Both of them still can put the letters of the ictus on the spokes. 
and that's why it became an interesting symbol to use because it was it was a little bit harder to draw of course than the two arcs that make up the fish but again it it's pretty beautiful in its simplicity but are making the case that the christian wheel or the ictus wheel is actually the first symbol of christianity now in modern terms we really only have one symbol that's kind of made a surge and that's the christian flag or the protestant flag some people call it this flag was originally conceived around 1890 and was officially created in 1907 and adopted by the methodist church there are three different pledges to it i have two of them here on the screen if you've grown up in the south you've probably seen this flag especially if you're from a non-liturgical church they tend to have them a lot the methodist church and the liturgical side does as well um, the mennonites use it it's used quite a bit the problem you have with the christian flag is when you're trying to fly the christian flag a lot of people are confused and kind of hesitant because they don't know where to put it do you put it above the american flag do you put it below the american flag do you put it on a separate flagpole a lot of times when you go into sanctuaries where they have the american flag and the christian flag they'll have it on two separate poles one on usually each end of the sanctuary so you don't have to worry about it of course the other big deal you have is if you're from texas what do you do there i mean i guess you just put up three flag poles and then put the american the texas and the christian flag all up at the same level and you don't have to worry about it oh and those of you who are not from texas you might be slightly confused by that last statement uh, now some of these you may be very familiar with um, the dove, you know, the good shepherd, the lamb, the anchor we've talked about, the ictus, whether it's in the symbolic form or an actual fish, the ark from Noah's ark, and those are pretty common. We do have two, though, that kind of stand out and have been, one of them has been kind of uh, co-opted let's talk about that and that's that's the symbol of when we're dealing with the symbol of the rainbow and the rooster these two particular symbols you might see especially in the southern part of the united states and that's because of the walk to emmaus the emmaus community is an interdenominational group that gets together and has retreats for men and for women finally get a chance to talk to them to uh, have church service with them and two of the symbols they use like I said are the rainbow and the rooster the rainbow is not just from Noah's Ark even though I have it on this page associated with Noah's Ark remember that it is the first symbol of God and it there are a couple of different variations of the rainbow flag if the rainbow flag has the purple on top and the red on bottom that is actually the international symbol for peace or the peace flag the flag is flipped in its correct form which is the red on top and the purple on bottom with seven colors that is the symbol of god and that's not just from noah's ark when he said the covenant between god and man will be the rainbow symbol but it also comes from revelation whenever john is able to look into the throne room of, of god and god is sitting on the throne it says that the rainbow is completely around him and encompassing him now unfortunately the rainbow has been taken and uh, taken over and co-opted by the gay and lesbian agenda so they use it as their symbol now and a lot of people don't know that it is an original symbol of God. And 
When you see sometimes on the bumpers of cars, you might see a rainbow flag that says De Colores, or you might see a rooster on the rainbow flag where it says De Colores. That is not, that doesn't mean they're advocating the rights of alternate lifestyles. That indicates that they're a follower of the walk to Emmaus. So, just for clarification there. Now in the next couple of slides, I'm just going to show you a couple of different symbols that you may not know about as far as animals specifically. I'm going to go pretty quickly through them and only hit a couple of them, but you can always stop the presentation and read the details. There are some amazing books and websites over the rich study of symbols in Christianity. But the first one... Some of these you may know, um, of course, the sand dollar, the scallop shell is used in a lot of baptisms, but there's also the sand dollar. And if you ever get a chance to look at a James Avery jewelry catalog, he tends to focus on a lot of early Christian symbols. And so you can actually learn quite a bit just looking through his jewelry catalog. But we have things that you may not realize like uh, the phoenix and the unicorn uh, you might want to take some time to actually read this section on the unicorn right here the peacock was used as an early one an early symbol We have the elephant, of course, the rose, the scarab is one that we normally don't associate with Christianity, but it actually was used quite a bit. And of course, it's supposed to represent going all the way down to the bottom and then having life come back up and resurrecting. Because remember, that's what made the scarab so sacred, especially in ancient Egypt, is it could go from the worst of the dung and then create life out of it. The owl is a twofold meaning, actually, um, and you might want to stop and read that. It is kind of fascinating because it symbolizes the turning away from the light by those that denied uh, Jesus. And then it also represents the one who is awake during the darkness or Jesus. So it's, it's interesting. And then the egg. Now, the egg even though it's associated with Ishtar or the celebration of Easter, which is not a Christian celebration, uh, and we've talked about that before, we do have um, the legend of Mary Magdalene, who goes to Emperor Tiberius with an egg and says that the egg symbolizes everything you need to know about Christianity. And he makes the comment that it symbolizes nothing, and that if it could turn scarlet and symbolize his blood, it might mean something. And this egg turns scarlet. And some think that is the beginning of the dying of eggs for Easter. Which is probably not the case. Uh, so we move over into the trefoil and the quatrefoil and the keys and a couple of other really powerful symbols. Now, the down here we have the sigla. And this is a really cool symbol right here, the sigla. And it was used by Constantine when he had a vision and the phrase came to him that said, with this sign you shall conquer. And he used it on the Roman standards and the Roman shields for a long time. It became such a powerful symbol that no other symbols basically were used for Christianity for a very long time because he ingrained this into the Roman culture so much. And then one of the last really interesting symbols we get on this page is the Torch of Truth. And the Torch of Truth is associated with the Dominican Order. Um, according to the story, uh, Dominic's mother had a vision when she was carrying him and it was a vision of a small black and white dog carrying the torch of truth 
and that has been put onto the heraldry that you'll see in the Catholic Church right here, the little dog down here in the corner. And then around 400, we see things move dramatically away from the sigla that Constantine had used for so long into a huge plethora of cross images. Now, we know back in about 150 or 160 AD, you have Justin Martyr, one of the early Christian apologists, and he argued that God put the cross in everyday objects. That you could see them in the cross beams of anchors. You could see them in the mast of ships. You could see crosses everywhere. Now, he wasn't implying that you should use the cross as a symbol for Christ at that time. Instead, he was implying that you should be constantly reminded every day of the suffering that Christ went through to save you. Because you got to always keep in mind that up until about 400, the cross was a horrible torture device. You would not have worn it around your neck as a symbol for Christ in the first couple of centuries of Christianity. But around 400, we see this explosion take place. And we're going to see these are just some of the main forms of crosses that you will see. So let me go through them quickly and give you a brief rundown if you've never seen some of these. So starting up here in the left corner, we have the simplest cross, which is the Tau cross. And if you recall from our conversation on crucifixion, that this is probably the style that Jesus was crucified on. Next to that, we have the Latin cross, which is the one that most people know. Then we have the Byzantine cross and the Slavonic cross, which has in it, both of them have a foot rest. This one on the Slavonic cross is tilted and it represents a couple of different things. One, it represents one side, the right side when you're on the cross. Um, points up to heaven the other side points down to hell which is also supposed to parallel the two thieves so the one pointing down would represent the side of Gestus the bad thief and the one pointing up to heaven would represent Saint Dismas the good thief then we have the Greek cross next to that and then we have this big fancy one over here on the side, this guy right here. This is the Jerusalem cross, all the way, otherwise known as the Crusaders cross. And it represents the four smaller crosses or the four gospels. Uh, the five crosses in total represent the five wounds of Christ. It was used a lot during, especially the Crusades and down the second row, we have the Maltese cross. Then we have the baptismal cross. And the baptismal cross, which is this one right here, is actually a combination of the St. Andrew's cross and the Greek cross. Then we have the graded cross, which has three steps right here. And the three steps are supposed to represent faith, hope, and charity. And then next to the graded cross, we have the evangelist cross. If you notice, it has four steps instead of three, and it's supposed to represent each of the Gospels. Then we have the St. Andrew cross, and then the Celtic cross on the end. We move down to this last row down here, and we get the woven reed cross, which is St. Uh, Bridget. Next to that, we have... St. Peter's cross, or it's also called the inverted cross. And this is another symbol that has been uh, co-opted or corrupted, some might say. And a lot of people who are fighting against Christianity or and some think the satanic use it a lot, they will use this upside down cross. Uh, similar to 
the rainbow flag being taken and used for other things. But in reality, it's not necessarily um, a negative thing. It is to symbolize that Peter thought that he was not worthy to be crucified in the way that Christ was crucified. So he requested to be crucified upside down. Next to that, we have the papal cross, and the papal cross has three cross beams in it because it's supposed to represent the three roles that the Pope has, which is the Bishop of Rome, uh, the Patriarch of the West, and the successor of Peter. Then we have the Lorraine cross next to that, and then at the end here, we have the Star of Bethlehem which has five points to represent the five wounds of Christ. And of course, if you take it and invert it upside down, that doesn't mean just because I said that crosses really took off in the 400s doesn't mean that they weren't used before. Um, it was pretty popular in the early second century and start of the third century for Christians to make the sign of the cross whenever they were praying. And they did it so much that a lot of pagans in the Middle East started to think that Christians worshipped the cross. And that caused a little bit of confusion. So that wraps up some of the major symbols and the huge variety that are out there of early Christian symbols. But there's one particular symbol that we're going to spend a little bit of time focusing on. And this is one that I've been asked about before, and I've actually seen several discussions online about this. Um, and that is this question. Why are there unicorns in the Bible? Yeah, I have seen some really heated debates online about this. I've read people who said that the entire Bible needs to be thrown out. And the reason that the Bible needs to be discounted and thrown out is because the unicorns are mentioned in the Bible. And that only... That's convenient, but it's not really well thought out. And let me explain why. There were unicorns. We know that. Uh, we have found skeletons of unicorns. We know that in North America, there was what we call the giant unicorn. <laughs> but that's actually not what we're talking about here. I mean, it might be in these passages, but I mean, we also had, you know, camels. So when we look in scriptures, depending on the translation, you will see things like this. God brought them out of Egypt. Yeah, that's uh, the strength of a unicorn. Notice it says a lot, the strength of a unicorn. The will to bind a unicorn with a band and furrow because he's really strong, obviously. Uh, it talks about the horn of the unicorn, horns of unicorns, and unicorns come down with them. Yeah. And the bullocks of the bulls and their land shall be soaked with blood and the dust made fat with fatness. Okay. That's interesting. So why are there unicorns mentioned so many times in scripture? You want to know, don't you? It's because of the translation. Remember, we had a shift. We went from Greek and Aramaic and, well, Hebrew and the Hebrew text and then Greek and Aramaic. Um, used in other texts. There is a little bit of Aramaic in the Old Testament. Um, we know that. Yeah. Especially in Daniel. Uh, but whenever we shifted into Latin, when St. Jerome started working with and creating the Latin Vulgate, he translated some words. Okay. And if you notice here, appear from the old text unicorn an animal with one horn the monoceros the name is often applied to the rhinoceros the rhinoceros says here in this section the second one 
a genus of quadrupeds of two species, one in which the unicorn has a single horn growing almost erect from the nose. This animal when full grown is said to be 12 feet in length. There is another species with two horns, the bicornis. They are natives of Asia and Africa. So when we had a translation take place and we moved from Greek into Latin, one of the things they translated was from rhinoceros into unicorn. And the reason we can know that for certain is if you've ever looked up the scientific name for a, an Asian one-horned rhinoceros, it is rhinoceros unicornis. So rhinos are basically fluffy unicorns. I mean, they are unicorns. So that's the reason you will see unicorns in the Bible. It depends on what translation you have and whether they took it from the Latin translation or whether they went back and pulled the text from the Greek translation. So when people make the argument that the Bible needs to be completely thrown out because there are unicorns in it, all they're doing is showing their ignorance and their inability to do any sort of rational thought. Anyway, that wraps up today's lecture on symbols and a little side note there on the unicorns because I always find that kind of funny. But I hope you all have a great day and shalom.